Hi, I'm DJ Ware. Today on the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to delve in and talk about is Linux becoming too fragmented? Stick around right after this. So I want to, yeah, I've been hearing this more and more that Linux is failing because it's too fragmented and they give a lot of reasons for that and I want to give you my take. So, and as always, you know, um, <laughs> mine's always based on history, I guess. So I'm going to go back <laughs> and talk about where this has happened before and um, and so that's what, that's what I'd like to do. So. The first question that I asked was, is Linux starting to follow in the footsteps of its predecessor? And that, of course, would have to be Unix. Yeah, Unix, Unix went down that road. It definitely went down that road. No question about it. So let's talk a little bit about what happened with Unix. And then <clears throat> what I'll do is try to compare and contrast what's going on with Linux today. So, so the first version of, of the Bell Labs Unix, this would be the research version of Linux. Whenever you're talking about version 5 or 6 or 11, <clears throat> you're talking about research Linux, which was the Bell Labs official release internally, where they did all the new code and developed new stuff. Uh, there was a commercial version that came out later, and that was the programmer's workbench. That was typified <clears throat> by uh, nomenclature such as well, PWB was the first one, and then you had System 3, you had System 5. Those were the commercial versions of, of uh, Unix. So <clears throat> that the first version that was really released for the educational market was in 1973. That was the first time that, that Bell Labs Unix appeared outside of the labs and was available for anyone else to use. Uh, in 1975, uh, Bell Labs released version 6, and that became the one that they fielded to the commercial businesses, and it was known as the programmer's workbench. <clears throat> but AT&T wanted quite a bit to license it to commercial companies. I, I suppose the reason what their thought there was that the commercial companies would be using this to make money and therefore could afford a $20,000 license, whereas the educational institutions would be using Unix to teach uh, students on how to build operating systems and compilers and utilities and it would be used in a teaching scenario and so they licensed it to the educational institutions as, at $200. And 1979 Unix System 7 kind of smoothed out the rough spots and it added support for one gig file systems as well as provided the first I.O. library where you now could in your C programs you had a higher level function that allowed you to interact with the uh, with streams and with the terminals and with your file systems. So, but at that same time, and, and there was a lot of commercial versions that were they liked the look of Unix, but they didn't want to buy the license, and so they created their own Unix workalikes. Uh, they were not Unix, but you had White Smith's uh, Idris and Mark Williams Coherent. And those came and surfaced. So already you had some surfacing of competition for Unix that was occurring in the commercial side of the business. In 1981, AT&T released their commercial version, System 3. And the reason for that was there was still a lot of people using version 6, and there was some using PWB, and there was some using version 7. So AT&T wanted to put all the elements of those together and create a single release that had the advantages of all three. And at the same time, what they did was, if you had a $20,000 license, you were now allowed to sub-license Unix for $100 to anyone that you wished. So <clears throat> at this point, I would say this is where AT&T fully committed to Unix. It wasn't just a lab toy at this point. Now it was a, it was a viable enterprise function. And they, and they got behind it really strong at this point within the limits of the uh, consent decree. So they were not allowed to go out and sell hardware and software at that point, and it wasn't until the breakup by Judge Green where AT&T could now go out and officially sell the Unix and sell hardware systems with Unix on it. So and Unix System 5 was really where that occurred, and now we started seeing Bell Labs versions of, of Unix being sold outside of the company. 
Uh, users <clears throat> were eligible for the same support. They could go and get training and service, uh, just like the Bell Labs people and the educational institutions were allowed to do as well. There were many, many improvements to that release, including a much faster file system. But one of the big changes in System 5 was that AT&T announced support for four different processor families. They would support Unix on the Intel 8286, the Motorola 68000, the National Semiconductor 16032, and the Zilog Z8000, which were all 16-bit <clears throat> uh, processors with some extensions, like the 286 had some extensions. So, <clears throat> meanwhile, outside of Bell Labs, there was a lot of activity going on at, up at this point. So you had software developers that had the source code for Unix, and when you give software developers the, soft code, uh, the software, they start improving things. And <clears throat> one of the biggest contributors here was the University of California at Berkeley. They began adding a lot of different things. They added EX, and they added the Vi Editor. Uh, there was also the Ingress Database Manager that uh, was developed around this time and was included in the BSD release. Uh, C shell was offered as a replacement for the Born shell. It had a lot of, it's, it's still, you can still use C shell even under Linux today. It isn't the original one, of course. It is the one that was developed by the GNU project, and we'll talk about that. But <clears throat> it has a lot of advantages if you're writing C code, as it has a lot of aliases and structures that were not originally in the Born shell. They have been added back into the Born Again shell. Uh, so <clears throat> there's not really a whole lot of advantage to running C shell today. Uh, but the, the, big, the other big thing was the generalized terminal interface called Curses, which was the display component of text and, gra and, and text-like graphics or, or uh, you know, your screens for doing data entry and stuff. And then there was the term cap entry, which allowed you to... So you had a generic way of displaying a high-level API, if you will, for displaying things on the screen. And the term cap translated the high level into the actual commands that the ter particular terminal needed, whether that be a DEC VT100 or whether it be a Tektronix 4106 or a WISE terminal or, you know, a data general, whatever was hooked up. <clears throat> but it did the translation so that you could write it once uh, and write your program once with the higher level curses API, and it didn't matter what terminals were uh, using it on the screen. Now, <clears throat> granted, there was some yeah there was some differences and, and but anyway it, it worked for the most part. It was called curses for a good reason though, uh, which is pretty much what we did when we were using it to write code. So uh, it did support la larger disk blocking factors, and so you could then support larger drives, larger files. But there was a number of general purpose utilities that were added as well, like more and apropos, finger, head, and string. Uh, uh, tail, by the way, came out later. Uh, tail came out later. Head was the original, which displayed the top part of the file up to a certain point, and then tail would display the bottom part of the file up to a certain point. So yeah, much of the and much of that code was placed in the in the public domain. But BSD really created a problem for Bell Labs in that their license didn't. They didn't know AT and T didn't know how to reconcile their license with the way the, uh, the University of California at Berkeley has placed things into the public domain uh, because there was limitations on being able to offer that software for commercial use. And so Berkeley Software Distribution was formed uh, as a means of sharing the code that the Berkeley folks wrote with uh, other education, other educational institutions, and later other corporations, as you'll see here in a minute. So yeah, Digital Equipment Corporation picked up BSD for a new line of computers called VAX, and they also developed a version, they also modified the version of BSD so it would run on their PDP-11 computers as well. So you had the kind of, so, in, as, as far as Bell Labs is concerned, they had always used Digital Equipment Corporation machines uh, like the DEC-10, the DEC-20, uh, in order to develop and write Unix. But here, for the first time, the newer machines weren't going weren't gonna to have uh, Unix available on it, at least initially. And I think they kind of worked on that and negotiated it. So uh, I think there was some talk about it, but I don't think it ever materialized that, that Unix was ever offered on the VAX or the PDP-11. But 
uh, BSD also ported uh, their system over to the 68000. That's the Motorola 68000. <clears throat> and that work was done by Unisoft Systems, and I think it was called Uniplus. Um, and uh, that was their version of uh, BSD for that series of machines. Also, AD AT&T adopted many of the applications where they could back into a the a Unix System 5. And, of course, later when they did the full merge with Sun, they, of course, merged in all of BSD and all of System 5 and, and created 4.2. So... <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that that was a huge project. But anyway, Interactive System was the first commercial organization with a Unix license. And in 1977, they were selling both hardware and software with Unix installed on it. Which they were quite successful. Later on, when AT&T released uh, the versions that allowed them to sub-license, then they created their own version of Unix with and offered us office automation software with it, and they called that IS-1. So right there, you see differentiation coming into the marketplace as, as corporations are trying to differentiate themselves from their competitors. <clears throat> Human computer resources specialized in translating Unix to other platforms such as Three Rivers, Perk, and National Semiconductor. And of course, later AT&T supported National Semiconductor, but they offered many different enhancements, including uh, the ability to, to overlay graphics and text together on the screen. Now, of course, there were other machines uh, around at the time that did that, so it's not unique, but that was the first time that Unix had it. Had it. This was way before the blip. So, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Venturacom developed Venix. Now, Venix is not the same as Unix. And that ran on the IBM PC. It also ran on the DEC LSI 11 slash 2. Uh, Microsoft was kind of late to the game. They didn't know what they wanted to do with DOS. And they were kind of, it was reaching a point where DOS just wasn't starting to cut it. Uh, a lot of people were starting to buy these uh, new uh, machines in business, these IBM PCs, and they wanted a way to, you know, get things together, get them communicating with one another. And, and I don't know if many of you ever worked with PC LAN, but it, it was pretty abysmal. And, uh, and so they really wanted a better answer. The, the DOS, I mean, you, you had to do all kinds of gymnastics to get networking to work under DOS, and it was not fun. Uh, because you're basically slamming something that requires uh, basically multi-concurrency in the operating system that's only designed to handle single threads or one at one particular thing at a time. So, yeah, it just was a, an ideal situation under DOS. So they were looking for something to replace it. So they contracted with other firms and they created Xenix. Uh, uh, for themselves, and they took that back, and they started to market it and sell it. It ran initially on the Radio Shack. I mean, there was a lot of machines it ran on, but it ran on the Radio Shack Model 16, and believe it or not, it also ran on the Apple Lisa. Although it was not, it was not the first choice uh, for the Apple Lisa, of course. Uh, but Phoenix was the operating system it ran initially until until the Lisa OS was developed and allowed it to take over. That, took, that would happen later, I think. Uh, in the development cycle. So <clears throat> that's when the market fragmented, uh, fragmentation started creating more distributions of Unix, and there were more and more lookalikes, workalikes that were not based on Bell Labs code. Uh, the Unix workalikes, there was uh, Cunix, which was a version that ran on the IBM PC. Yeah, IBM PC 8088. And, and Unix cannot run on an 8-bit machine. 8088 is hybrid. It's 8-bit instruction, 16-bit data, and register. Unix could not run on that platform, but Cunix could, and it could also run inside of 64K of memory. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, and it, they're still around, by the way. Uh, they're, a clo they're considered closed, a closed-source company today, but they do run uh, their version of Unix still today, or Unix-like operating system today, as we're supposed to call it. Um, Lantech developed uh, Unitech, and that was uh, that allowed up to 10 concurrent applications or tasks to run on separate windows of the PC screen. So <clears throat> right right now, you're starting to see, right there, you're starting to see a kind of a primitive version of Windows starting to surface on the PC. Uh, but by the time the 8286 showed up, the suits were already starting to surround 
uh, Unix as a viable way to make money in both selling software, hardware, and total solutions, end-to-end -end solutions. And one of those companies was Altos. And they, they ran Xenix on an 8086 CPU. And of course, they expanded their line up until the point where I think they were bought out eventually and uh, disappeared into the woodwork. I think they were purchased by Acer, <clears throat> if my memory serves me right. And Acer really wanted them for their distribution channels, not so much for their, uh, their IP or their intellectual property. But um, the ACS 8600 supported up to six users. It cost around $6,000. And it was a 10 megahertz 8086 and had 10 megabytes of hard disk space. So, yeah, in those days, uh, there was there was some uh, vertical applications that ran on Altos for the medical industry as well. So, it, yeah, you'd probably run into those and back then in that day in hospitals that Altos was in medical records and they were in transcription. Uh, they also did uh, studies uh, on... Uh, tracking patients through the system as to their progress against treatment plans that uh, they were on and under and it allowed them to, to file reports with Medicare in some of those places as well, as I recall. Um, <clears throat> IBM developed their own Unix, or excuse me, Intel developed their own uh, version of Unix systems that were aimed at OEMs uh, to provide future support for 8286 uh, systems. That would be the motherboards and the cards and the firmware and everything that went with it. I remember <clears throat> at that time there was really two versions of that. There was a, <clears throat> a blue version. Hang on. There was a blue version and a white version. Uh, and I think the blue version <clears throat> was used to develop uh, the interfaces around the chip. That it would be the motherboard and the support processors around it and the north and south uh, south uh, lane or lands, uh, excuse me, the north gate and south gates that were at, around at the time to manage parts of the system that the processor could not. <clears throat> The white one was used, I think, more for software development, operating systems, firmware, and things like that in the support of boards. That's what I kind of remember. If you know differently, please correct me. Uh, I had I had limited exposure to those when I was working for Burroughs. There, I, I would pass them when I was working out in the plant for the uh, engine systems that uh, Burroughs was selling at the time. I, I did some work out there for about two or three years, on and off doing QA work for that. Uh, Hewlett Packard developed its own implementation in Unix for the HP 9000s, and <clears throat> one of the first now that when when uh, Bell Labs was working with DEC, the largest machines at the time that Unix was ever deployed on were were like the DEC 10 and DEC 20s, and later uh, the Berkeley systems went up onto the Vaxes, but those weren't those were only one megahertz machines, so they weren't really big or powerful. But the Perkin Elmers were a little bit different. They were they were still mini computers, but they were much larger, and so they were really the ones that pushed the bar up for how far you could go with Unix, and so they kind of set the milestone for larger installations of Unix. So again, here we go. We're we're starting to differentiate further into uh, into the support for uh, you know the uh, uh, operating system as well. <clears throat> so, I thought you said you were going to talk about them wanting to replace DOS, Microsoft. Yeah, they, they did look at it, but let me, let me tell you, it wasn't replacing DOS at all. What their plans were was to make DOS look and work like a single-user version of Xenix. Does that sound familiar? Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, they didn't want to break their gold mine in selling DOS, uh, and because uh, that's where the application base was, and so they didn't want to throw in a new operating system and then lose all their customers because everybody was just going to stay on DOS anyway. So, and rather than look at a merger between DOS and Xenix, that would have taken too much effort, uh, and they didn't want to become the PC Unix, uh, I guess, was, was the problem. So they went that way for a while where they added improvements to DOS to make it look like Xenix, and uh, they did that pretty badly. And then eventually, of course, we all know they started developing Windows. And, um, and they kind of left. There was still Xenix implementations being sold up until the 
early 90s. And, uh, and of course, uh, um, that all got involved in the lawsuits that were coming down after uh, AT&T broke up further. And, <clears throat> and Unix kind of fell into uh, the hands of many different companies. And then they started suing each other until there was nothing left. So, <laughs> and at that time, about that time, <clears throat> Linus Torvalds was starting to work on a kernel. Uh, and so, and at the same time, uh, Richard Stallman had formed the GNU project. <clears throat> and I think that was an outgrowth of a um, MIT AI project with, I think it was Symbolics, where they had uh, a software that had that they were depending on it to be free and open source, and then Symbolics took over that software and <clears throat> wanted to charge them a license to use it, but wouldn't share the source code with them. And so it's amazing what anger will do. And Stallman was angry, and so he formed the GNU project. And basically, and never again are we going to allow this to happen. <clears throat> And so he was out setting out to build a whole new operating system and an operating system environment around it. And initially it was based on the mock kernel and their version is called Herd or GNU Herd. And the reason it's called Herd, this is what I understand it to be. So there was, out in Nevada, there was a cluster of mock machines that were running and they called them a Herd. And so he borrowed the name and, and used it for the GNU version of the mock kernel. But he had a lot of delays because he was waiting. Carnegie Mellon, Mellon uh, University owned the licenses for Mock, and they were not free uh, and open. And they weren't even they they were not free, and so he was waiting for them to release Mock as a, as free software, and then he was going to include it into the GNU projects, and have a kernel that would run along with the tools, utilities, libraries, and compilers that he was developing for his system. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, you know, at the time, all these lawsuits were flying around, so he had to be really careful not to borrow and, and use any code that might be in the BSD or AT&T camp because he would be in, injected into that lawsuit uh, right away. Now, Linux did get drawn into it. Uh, briefly, but uh, after it was shown and proved that there was no code in it that came from Unix, uh, they went on their merry way, and the Linux community continued to sue itself into oblivion. So, as I said, the GNU project, Richard Stallman was the founder, uh, <clears throat> and Stallman was never a supporter of open source software. He said, he said that if you go read the book Open Sources by Chris DeBona and Sam Ackman, he's very clear in there. He's also very clear on the GNU project pages that he is not a fan of open source. <clears throat> and he gives a lot of reasons why, and well, I can understand his reasoning. <clears throat> he is a champion of free software. <clears throat> so what he's really looking for, software that he can use for free, uh, including the source code, and that comes with no ties or no limits on how it can be used and how it can be modified. So, um, that's what he was looking for, but he, he, if you look at Unix System 5 at the time when this was started, it was a million lines of code. They had completed, Bell Labs had completed the migration between Sun, uh, the Sun OS, which was a Berkeley system distribution, and Unix System 5 version 4, and they created 4.2. So it was a million lines of code and that was in that distribution. That would be a huge undertaking for, I don't know how many people he had working on this, but it probably was just skeleton, probably him and a few others that were working on it. That would have taken a lifetime to do. <clears throat> so he, he started looking around for any piece of free software that he might be able to incorporate and use in the GNU project that would fill the gaps that he needed in order to create a full operating system that he could use. So uh, <clears throat> Tech was chosen as the typesetter. X Windows was chosen as the Windows system. And Linus Torvalds made the Linux kernel available as free software in 1992. And so that was incorporated into the GNU project. And it was chosen as the GNU project kernel. And so that's where everything was born. And, we, <clears throat> and there was even a definition of what needed to be included into a distribution. And that, that definition is, is that a Linux kernel provided by the Linux Foundation uh, and uh, 
the GNU tools and libraries. They had to have a package management system because he did not write one. Uh, additional software that could be added on from other developers. There was documentation. Uh, you could include a Windows system or a, and a Windows manager and a desktop environment if you wanted. Uh, but, but the software, and, and most of the software is free and open source. However, and a lot of people are running around saying GNU Linux. So uh, that has a very specific meaning. And, and GNU does have a certification process where they identify those distributions as adhering to the GNU and the Free Software Foundation's guidelines on software. It has to be free of any proprietary code and any code which requires licensing that restricts its use. So that lets out Debian, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Arch, they're all out. None of those are approved by the GNU project uh, because either they don't have clear guidelines on how software is included, they're including proprietary pieces of code in their libraries, or there's just questionable types of things that he couldn't get answers from, and so he could not include them in all good conscience. If you go to his site, he will show you the distributions that were opted out, and he'll show you the ones that were opted in. So if you're saying GNU Linux, you're really talking about ones that were approved by the GNU project, and there's only a handful of those, and none of them are mainstream. So that's uh, so all I'm going to say about that. So if you're using GNU Linux, that, that has connotations on a very specific thing about Linux. Uh, so you can call it GNU Linux if you want, but I'm just saying that it's not co quite correct. <laughs> so AJ Lou's boot root was the first disk image pair with Linux and had an absolute minimum of code. I have seen it. I've seen pictures of it. I had no desire to run it. It looked pretty abysmal to me. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, anyway, MC Interim uh, came out in 1992. That, if you go and look at the Linux wiki, you can see that there are a lot of distributions that were based off of that that go stretching out over time into the present. So it's had a pretty profound effect on the distributions of Linux going forward. Soft landing Linux system, SLS arrived in 1992, and Yudrizel, Yudrizel, Yudrizel uh, a Linux GNU and X was first commercial distribution that was released late in 1992, I think it was in December. Uh, I am going to include SUSE Linux in this because, <clears throat> yeah, they're derived from SLS, but I think they're unique enough to be included on their own today. Uh, <clears throat> they they have a lot of different things in, the, in their releases that are not the same as they were when they originally started. So I included them here. They are a founder as far as I'm concerned. Maybe you disagree, but that's fine. You, we can always ag ag agree to disagree. Uh, Slackware arrived in 1993. It's also based on SLS. <clears throat> and the reason why I include it here is because it has a lot of derivatives of, of its own. Uh, and also, it was really the first one that, was, that would work. SLS, uh, not, I mean, if you, you see this hair patch on the back of my head? That, that, that's missing because of SLS. Uh, Debian arrived in 1993. Red Hat was founded in 1993, but they did not produce a release until 1994. <clears throat> I include them, at, uh, Debian and Red Hat as founders, uh, because there is they don't derive from anything. They started up with their own set of, uh, I mean, they took the GNU tools, they took the Linux machines, and then they wrote and developed the rest of the system around it. Mandriva, I included here because they are definitely one of the founders. They've been around since 1998. <clears throat> they 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 are long gone, unfortunately, but their uh, their derivatives survive uh, and to this day. And there there's Open Mandriva, which is still around, which is based on on the original philosophy and design of Mandriva. Arch Linux I included because again it's un it's a unique. It brings a lot of unique things into the Linux. Uh, to, uh, into the Linux sphere, and so I think they should be included. And of course, they arrived in 2002. So all of these can claim. Uh, there's a lot of distributions that really can claim their roots from these systems, and uh, yeah. So if you consider that fragmentation, okay, that's fair enough. But 
most of the authors today that are talking <clears throat> about Linux fragmentation are talking about the desktop environment. Uh, I don't agree. It, the desktop environment has, I mean, okay, that's that's a difference in how things get displayed, but that's not where fragmentation is occurring. And if you're saying it's the desktop environment, you're really missing the bigger picture here. And there is fragmentation that's going on in Linux right now. So, yeah, so the division I'm going to be talking about is the same one that came about with Unix, and that was when the suits showed up. I always say that it's the suits, but it's, it's the corporations looking to make money and to sell it and, and differentiate themselves so that they are unique in the marketplace. <clears throat> Fragmentation is occurring from Intel, Microsoft, Red Hat, and Ubuntu. Uh, Intel wants to create the best performing Linux, but they're only willing to give it to you on your Intel hardware. So they won't guarantee it'll be it'll it'll perform as well or better on AMD. What they're doing is they're building in every single thing they can to make it run fast on their hardware. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not scolding them. I'm just telling you that's a differentiation uh, from the other distributions. Second, I'm going to skip Microsoft for now. Uh, I think I'm going to do a, going to do a whole topic on what they're doing. Red Hat wants to expand its business into the cloud orchestration, distributed distributed file systems, and into the server market in general. Uh, they have, in the past, kind of done you know some hamming and hawing around the desktop, but. Uh, the only one they're really committed to is Fedora, and the only reason why they're committed to Fedora is that's the development platform for Red Hat. So it's kind of like they support the desktop like a hangman supports a rope. They're not really interested in it. They don't really care about it. Where they make their money is in the, the business side of things, and that's fine. Uh, Ubuntu, same thing. They're also committed to the server market. They're trying to get in deeper and make more money there. Uh, and, yeah, they they... They have a, a desktop environment. They're, they're, they do a good job with it. They, it it's, it's a good system. They're trying to push their package standard based on SnapD. And again, not scolding them, just telling you that's fragmentation in the market. Uh, if As long as these companies are continuing to do things that, that differentiate themselves, then those features, I know they say that SnapD runs on on Fedora and I remember an interview just a couple of weeks ago where one of the developers was telling me it doesn't run as good on Fedora as it does Ubuntu. Well that's a violation of your promise to the community that there would be nothing in SnapD that would make it run better on Ubuntu than any other distribution. So if that's the case then you are differentiating your system. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, <coughs> Microsoft. Let's go back to them. So just like Unix, Microsoft has it backwards again. I mean, they want Windows to look and work like Linux. <laughs> so they want their APIs on top of, of Linux. They want their APIs on top of, of the, like DirectX. They want that to become part of the Linux standard, but they want it to run Windows first. And, you know, the calls are made for Linux, but then it has to have Windows in order to execute it. So that's that's kind of the same thing they were doing with Xenix on uh, on uh, DOS. I mean, they're trying to preserve their environment, our Windows environment, by using Linux to, to plug up the gaps in their operating system. And just the name, Windows Subsystem for Linux, Windows isn't the subsystem. Linux is the subsystem. Uh, and the way I read their architecture, uh, and that's true for both WSL 1 and 2. Why do I say that? Well, I went out and installed it. So the first thing you have to, I mean, the first thing I came across on their website, I should show it to you. Uh, the first thing I came across on the website was, why, why install Linux under a, a virtual machine or put it alongside and have to be forced to boot into it every time you want to use it? Just use WSL. You don't need the overhead of a hypervisor in order to do it. Well, after I started installing, I found out that was a lie. You have to have hypervisor components in order to run it. Well, guess what? That's also true if you want to run Docker on Windows. You have to have hypervisor components in order to run Docker. 
And guess what? If you want to use Kubernetes, you have to have hypervisor, uh, Hyper-V components to run it. So who you kidding, Microsoft? This is all built around strengthening your position and making you look good. So, yeah, and, and Hyper-V, is, by the way, is only available on the Windows Pro, Windows Enterprise, <clears throat> and Windows Education versions. You will not get, find it on home. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, so my advice to uh, people that want to run WSL, why don't you just forget WSL and just install Linux? Because under Linux, you don't need Hyper-V components. You can just run Docker. You don't need Hyper-V components to run Kubernetes. You can just run Kubernetes. You don't need Hyper-V components to run Linux. You can just run Linux. So yeah, you can run the tools, the libraries, they're open and they're free to use. And what does it matter if you have to put it in a hypervisor on its own machine or alongside your drives? I mean, who cares? That is not a big enough reason to use WSL. All you're gonna do is trap yourself in the web of Microsoft's madness. So yeah, as far as the embrace, extend and extinguish, my version of it is embrace Linux, extend Linux and extinguish Windows. Hope to see you all again real soon. And don't fill up my mail with hate mail. It's called an opinion. And uh, hope to see you all later. Bye for now.